Hello and welcome to the Buy, Sell, Hold Spotlight presented by Sports Car Market Magazine. I'm Darren Roberge. Before we begin, please take a moment to like this video and subscribe to our channel. Also be sure to join in the conversation and share your thoughts by leaving us a comment below. Our guest today is Colleen Sheehan. She is partner at Ferraris Online. Welcome, Colleen. Thank you. For those who may not be familiar with you, may not know you, why don't you give a little bit of background and introduce yourself? So uh, I grew up around exotic cars. My dad, Mike Sheehan, founded our company 52 years ago. And so I began racing with him when I was a little kid and just kind of fell in love with everything about cars. Uh, so by the time I was a late teenager, I just knew that this was kind of what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And I've been working uh, in the automotive world. I specialize in selling classic Ferraris, uh, doing that for over 10 years now. So it's just kind of been an integral part of my life forever. Well, you had a fascinating introduction to the uh, to the, the collector car world involving a BMW and, and, a, and a, a little tiny event that uh, that's upcoming here in August. Why don't you give us the story there? <laughs> so, uh, w because my dad's been selling exotic cars forever, he was doing a package deal, and uh, there was you know Ferraris, Lambos, all kinds of interesting stuff. But there's this one car; it's a 1930 BMW. It was part of the collection. And the buyer just didn't really care about it. And so my dad thought it was cute. So he said, you know what? I'll take that and give it to my kid. And, uh, you know, it'll be part of the commission. So ended up with this car and my dad entered it in Pebble Beach. It's always been titled in my name. Uh, so he entered it under my name. And, uh, it, so it was at Pebble Beach when I was 11 years old in, 2003 and uh we did the tour in it and of course i didn't drive on the tour my dad was driving but since it was entered in my name somebody walked up to my dad and said by chance if this car were to win a prize could she drive it across the podium and my dad goes of course and so the guy walks away and my dad turns to me and says you're getting driving lessons <laughs> so uh i had during go-karts and, and stuff like that at that point, but not, not a, uh, 1930, no synchros BMW, you know? <laughs> and, uh, so we sat in the parking lot at the hotel and he taught me how to drive the car. And the next day it got third in class and I drove it across the podium. That makes that you the youngest person that's ever driven across the podium at Pebble Beach, correct? Yes. Unbelievable. Unbelievable story. Amazing indeed. So you mentioned yeah. Flutters Online is 52 years old. Kind of give us a background on how that started. Of course, your father was a sports car market contributor for, for many years. Uh, maybe talk about him a little bit. Um, and then kind of what made you sort of jump into the family business uh, when you did? So uh, my dad started out with a shop. We've always been based in Southern California. And he did uh, restorations and sales. He was one of the largest Ferrari restoration shops uh, back in the 70s and 80s and started in sales. I mean, he sold some incredible cars. Uh, I, I have memories of him driving me to school in a McLaren F1, uh, you know, 333 SP sitting in the garage at home. Just crazy stuff that when you're eight, nine, ten years old, you don't realize how special that is. Uh, but now looking back, I'm like, <laughs> wow, that was that was a crazy childhood. And uh, so uh, probably 20 years ago or so, my dad shut down the restoration portion of the business and we are exclusively sales now. Uh, I think the time that really kind of struck me that I really wanted to uh, spend the rest of my life dealing with cars was um, maybe not fully hit me, but that that moment when I drove my BMW across the podium, just it made my passion for these cars so strong that that just followed with me the rest of my life. And being around my dad, I mean, we work great together. And so it just made kind of falling into the family business pretty easy. Yeah, so you pretty much knew from right from the beginning. And that was kind of the next thing I wanted to ask you about is that 
you see family dynamics in 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 businesses like this. Of course, there was a, a very popular reality show uh, about a family that built motorcycles in New York for many years, where they pretty much killed each other. Um, so, like, how do you guys sort of manage that? And and it, and it sounds like you have a, a pretty positive dynamic with the two of each other. But I, I would imagine there's some challenges there that may not be present in other situations. Yeah, I mean, when you're working with family, it's not like it's always the smoothest but at the same time uh when you're working with just about anyone it's not like it's always the smoothest but i could not imagine doing business with anyone else you know just the way i was able to join in the family business and learn so much uh I grew up learning from him so i already kind of knew um his teaching style and and all that so that was really easy and then me and my dad uh both do certain things in similar ways, how we file paperwork and organize certain stuff. So it was really easy to just kind of be on the same page as far as like how the business operates in that sense. Uh, so, and we both have the same passion. So that made working together easy. Plus, I mean, we're there eight, 10 hours a day together, but we have separate offices and we kind of, um, I, take care of these cars. He takes care of these cars. Like we separate what we're doing. So there's not too much overlap. So it's, it runs pretty smooth. <laughs> yeah. You've got a system for sure. It sounds like, so you, you mentioned that you guys don't really do necessarily restorations anymore, but you kind of do them on the side for yourselves, correct? Uh, well, so we don't have a, a real shop anymore at all. We have our showroom and then we have an area with a lift where we could work on our own stuff. I mean, I'm doing a restoration on one of my personal kind of weird cars right now um but we don't do our own full restorations uh if we have a car that needs a major service or anything like that we send it to some of the local shops that we trust okay so uh, is there any car out there anywhere that you've never had before you've never bought you've never sold you've never had anything to do with it's kind of on your bucket list that you're out there sort of actively looking for right now well, I mean, maybe not actively looking for, but if I had to pick a bucket list car, so if there's one car that I could sell, it would be, um, and I actually just got to see it at Goodwood a couple of weeks ago, uh, 1957, uh, 250 Testarossa, the white one with the blue stripe, Lucy Bell. Uh, I would love to, to have anything to do with that car, buy and sell, or cause my, my dad's bought and sold that car three times and, uh, he raced it in the Milamilia Milia in 1988. So I, I've i seen photos and he told me it's one of the best handling cars of that era in existence. And so I've always kind of been in love with that car. You know, it's hard not to. It's gorgeous and drives great. So that would definitely be a bucket list car. It's a pretty good one, certainly. So and, you, and you've done some pretty extensive traveling doing car stuff lately. Why don't you kind of talk about that a little bit? No. Yeah. Uh, I, so just recently I came back from Europe. I was there for three weeks and, uh, went all over the place. So we went to nine different countries. Uh, and the first few days we were there. So went to, started off going to Le Mans Classic and then over to Spa for the 24 hour race and then stopped by Nurburgring and then Zandvoort. And so we ended up going to, uh, and we stopped in Luxembourg on the way. So we went to five different countries, four different racetracks in three days. <laughs> so, three and that days? was just, and that was the first three days of our trip too. <laughs> that's so, probably a pretty, uh, pretty amazing bucket list type of trip. Most definitely. And that's, have you ever done anything like that before? Or was this kind of the first time? Kind of the first time. Uh, I mean, I've done a lot of traveling for work, but most of it is, shorter trips definitely i mean you know go up to retromobile for four or five days for the the show stuff like that uh but this one it was the different race tracks and then there was some time in between those races and goodwood so i took that time to kind of go and visit clients and other dealers and just go and talk to people and and some people that I've talked to for a long time, but never actually had a chance to meet them face to face. So I figure while I'm 
all the way around the world. I want to meet as many people as I can while I'm there, you know? That's awesome. I love stuff like that, definitely. So back on our shores, uh, you got some pretty pretty solid bucket list cars in inventory right now. Let's let's kind of talk about some stuff that you currently have for sale. Uh, 1967 Ferrari 330 GTC. It's the one 140th produced of 598. It's a, an original Italian delivery with uh, 40,000 original miles on it. Tell us a little bit about this car, uh, what the asking price is. And and I've stated on this show repeatedly that I think the 330, the GTC, and the GTS are the two best uh, road-going Ferraris ever produced. Uh, either confirm or deny on that. Oh, I, I definitely confirm. Uh, we actually got a second 330 GTC in that I just filmed two days ago. And uh, driving those two cars, I mean... They're incredible. Uh, <laughs> so the the red one that's currently advertised, because the gold one we just got in is not on the website yet. But uh, the red one we're asking five fifty, and the gold one we're going to be asking five ninety five. Uh, and so the red one on the website right now it's it's a great car. It drives like a dream. I just I love how three thirties drive. I think that they're comfortable and powerful and the visibility is great it's kind of a mixture of all the best aspects of a 60s ferrari and then um it is so obviously with these cars uh they they're divided into different categories projects drivers really nice drivers um you know fully restored kind of show cars so this one i'd call a nice driver because the paint's nice, interior's nice. It's been mechanically maintained. It's not perfect by any means, but you can get in it and drive it around and enjoy it without any issue. And I've always loved those cars because when you have a fully restored show car, you're scared to drive it at all, you know, whereas something that's a good driver, you can enjoy and use kind of as they were built to be used. Yeah, I would think that car would be a fantastic candidate for something like the uh, the Copper State 1000 or the Colorado Grand or something along those mm-hmm. lines. Something you can actually go and enjoy and have experiences in versus just stare at. So really beautiful yeah. car, no doubt. Moving forward a little bit more towards the modern side of things, um, we kind of talk about the 550 a lot, but I sort of feel like the 355 is a little bit sort of uh, less prevalent right now in certain respects. But this is a really, really good one. This is a 1998 Ferrari F355 Spider six speed. It's gray, the Grigio colors. I've said over and over again are the best colors on Ferraris. Any Grigio iteration on an Italian car is awesome. And this one's had a recent engine out service. It's only got 15,000 miles on it. Compare this to the 550. Obviously, you know, kind of give us the pricing rundown on each one. This car is more of a modern Ferrari. Obviously, the, the, the mid-engine design. And and in my opinion, this is the best sounding of the, all the modern Ferraris. Um, so, you know, who's the buyer for this versus who's the buyer for a 550? Where do you see them kind of going and what are you asking for this particular car? So that car we actually have under contract with payment due in a couple of days at 125000 And the buyers are... so. I've had a lot of clients who have both those cars or I have clients who prefer one or the other. And it really depends kind of what they're looking for. So the 355 definitely falls into the much sportier car, whereas the 550s fall into that grand touring, long distance, comfort and luxury style driving. So the buyer for a 355 usually is not planning on Buying it with the hopes or intent of taking it one day from where I am in California to Vegas on a road trip or something like that, because it's not good on luggage space and, you know, driving a lot of the more sporty cars like that after five hours, like on a trip to Vegas, it it can start to beat you up a little bit. Whereas the 550s, they have the luggage space. They're, they're much more just, uh, purpose built towards that style of driving where you can do a five hour drive and be comfortable, have the AC going and, and just enjoy it. So you've sold far fifties too. So like, well, you know, what's a good price for something like that and, and rate the sound between the two. I'm, I'm pretty, uh, pretty on the, the, the F three fifty five. That thing sounds outrageous. Oh yeah. No, the three five five definitely sounds better when you have the RPMs up. It just has this kind of, scream to it that it's it's just incredible 
And it definitely sounds more sports car, more, you know, fast and go-kart style handling and and quick and all that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I gotta agree. The 355 sounds better, but uh the 550, you really it's hard to beat the sound of a front engine V12 Ferrari. Uh there's just something about that that rumble and and that sound that it's it's one of my favorite things, you know, is I always liked the grand touring cars. So while the sports cars are great, you know, if I were to pick between the two, I'd probably go with the 550 uh, just because that's my taste. It doesn't mean it's right or wrong. <laughs> it's just everyone's personal preference kind of thing, you know. And uh, so that's a big thing. Yeah, it's hard to argue with that. Definitely. So. You mentioned projects, and you have a really interesting one for sale uh, currently right now. 1961 Ferrari 250 G, uh, GT PF Cabriolet Series 2 car. 109th of 200 produced. It's got a factory hardtop, which is really cool. Uh, it's a semi-completed project. Um, so with this particular car, what are the what's the work that's been completed? What's still needed? What are the advantages or disadvantages of buying a car like this? And then, you know, what's the asking price on this car? So I really like this one. Uh this PF cab is, so when you think of project, a lot of times the first thing that comes to mind is some rusty car that's been sitting forever that you don't know what the issues could be with it. You know, you could start stripping it down and find it looks like Swiss cheese underneath, uh, <laughs> which, you know, is, is a possibility with a lot of project cars. But this one, uh, it was, the guy who had it before, he bought it and was restoring it. And it was, he had a, a very nice shop of his own. Uh, he had a bunch of cars and he had so many different project cars like this that he had been working on that basically all his project cars would take forever. They were just not getting done because he had too many. Uh, so we have stack invoices like that thick and the um the chrome was done the baronis were done um it was stripped down and primered the engine was gone through suspension was gone through uh new interior new top so it was basically halfway done and he gave up on it uh and so it's even and it's matching numbers i've uh, i drove the car a few times and it's kind of crazy because, um, the, so the seat is re, the seats are reupholstered, but none of the carpets or anything are in yet. They're sitting in boxes on the side. Uh, the passenger seat isn't even bolted down and, uh, the, the fuel tank isn't hooked up. So I put a little gas can and connected the little fuel line and everything in the, the trunk and drove it around that way. Uh, but it started up right away. It, pulled strong i went through all the gears um and it drove great you know it was i think the only thing uh that i've seen because i went through all the parts and everything the only thing i've seen on this car that is not there is the exhaust uh but other than that all the parts are with the car and it's basically as secure of a project as you could envision because um you don't have to strip down a car and wonder what's underneath. It's a lot of it's already been done. It just needs somebody to decide what color they want it to be painted and stick it all together, which is always a great thing. And that one we're asking uh, just under 1.3 million. That's so, I mean, it's, it's a neat car, definitely. And and people, I think, kind of underrate those those Series 2 PF cabs a little bit. I mean, there's not too many of those things around and, and they're really nice driving cars, too. So that's going to be a really good project for somebody, most definitely. So oh, yeah. moving on to the 80s retro stuff, uh, you currently have all, versions of all three of the Ferrari 308s in stock. Uh, yes. So we're a quick rundown of each car, uh, sort of describe the differences and then the below the surface kind of driving experiences and then compare maybe the current and future collectability and kind of give us the asking prices on those cars. So uh, we'll start. The first one is a 308 GTS. So we have the GTS and the GTB. And I love how drastically different the two cars are because Ferrari produced so many 308s. They, uh, 
a lot of people would kind of personalize some of their cars. And so the 308 GTS we have, somebody put on uh, different wheels, non-stock wheels that they liked and a different shift knob and, you know, a couple little personal touches, which because those cars are so easy to work on and um, fairly, you know, compared to other Ferraris, they're uh, not as expensive. So I've seen a lot of kind of customization and then it has a little bit more mileage. I think it's about 55 or 60,000 miles. Uh, so that's kind of one end of the spectrum. And then the other end of the spectrum is the silver 308 GTB we have. And that one is one owner from new, all original. And it comes with every single piece of paperwork from new. It even includes back then, uh, cassette players were a new thing. So the cassette player would have a little tag hanging on it saying how to use your cassette player. And that is even still in the file with the original bill of sale and the rest of the paperwork. Uh, and that one's a low mile car. I think it's under, I think it's like 25,000 miles, something like that. But uh, they're both carbureted 308s. And so you kind of get the the difference between the two where they're similar years, but because they made so many fewer uh, GTB versus the GTS, the GTB is always more valuable. And then because this one is more desirable colors, the silver over black versus the other one, which is red over black and um, all original, all that. So the asking price difference, the red 308 GTS, we're asking 67000 and the silver GTB, we're asking 149000 And I love the variation in the sense that if you have a buyer who wants something that they just can enjoy and, you know, it's not, um, they, they want a lower price, but just a good Ferrari they can enjoy, then the GTS is a great option. And then if you have a collector who just wants kind of the best of the best and something to enhance and add to their collection, then the silver GTB is a great option. So you kind of get that wide variety. And the third one we have right now is a white 328 uh, GTS. So the later variation. Um, and those, I, I've always loved the 308 series, I think. The ECUs are pretty bulletproof, so you don't get those electronic gremlins. They're easy enough to service, where if you're mechanically inclined, you can do it yourself. Uh, so I've always liked those cars because I just think they're, as far as Ferraris go, pretty reliable, you know? Yeah, that uh, the GTS seems like it's probably going to be quite an opportunity for somebody, great entry-level car for somebody to get into and actually do something with and build something up or do really whatever they want with it, which is yeah. uh, a great thing, certainly. You guys have had the uh, the plastic vetros a few different times too. Um, you know, kind of describe the driving experience there and what you what you kind of uh, how, how you would compare that to some of the other cars. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we have yeah we have the fiberglass uh, 308 as well, and so they are lighter weight than the steel cars. And to to collectors, basically, uh, the fiberglass is always the number one option because they made the fewest. So. Uh, between the lightweight and then the Euro models were uh, dry sum, whereas the U.S. were wet sum. But if you can get a Euro model fiberglass 308 in an interesting color, that's kind of like the, the cream of the crop, you know. <laughs> and so the one we have, uh, it was stored for quite a few years. Uh, so basically it went through one family where... Uh, the dad had it, then the daughter had it, and the daughter's husband. So it kind of stayed in one family forever and ended up in storage for many years. So we just had a cam belt service done on the car. And then now we're just finishing up going through the brake lines and a couple little finishing touches. Uh, so previously we had it advertised uh, just as it was, but we decided that it'd be better to service it and just have it to where, because it has some cosmetic flaws. It's all original, but uh, unlike the silver GTB we have, it does have some nicks and some flaws in the paint and seats have a little bit of wear in the bolsters. 
So it's the kind of car where if it's mechanically sound and serviced, the next owner could either enjoy it as it sits or they could decide to restore it or do whatever. I don't think it needs full restoration, but, you know, do whatever you want with it and you could paint it a different color or keep it the same color. So it kind of leaves it up to the imagination of the next buyer for whatever they want to do with it. Yeah, I love cars like that. Like, you know, cars that, that show honest, honest use and, and that were well cared for and, and loved by somebody like a family member. And that seems like one of those cars, definitely. And remind me, what was the asking price on that car? Uh, that one we're asking 140. 140, indeed. Cool car, no doubt. Another cool car you have. And you guys have sold quite a few of these over the years. Um, the one you have in stock now, though, is pretty, pretty neat. 1972 Ferrari 246 GTS Dino. It is Giallo Fly Yellow, 37,000 miles, 47 year ownership on this car so um you know a, the dino market has done wild stuff over the past couple of years and obviously you have a lot of experience with dinos you've sold them for years so maybe explain kind of why they're now where they are in the marketplace explain the, the benefit of color obviously the dinos came in all kinds of awesome colors and yeah. the 47 year ownership is really important explain why that well why that's such a big deal as well well when cars go through a bunch of different hands throughout the years. It's kind of, you don't know what each different owner did to the car, maintaining it, or no matter what the circumstance, having one owner kind of helps um, know more about the history because a lot gets lost the more things trade hands. And whether that's paperwork or books and tools or all kinds of stuff. Uh, so, one owner is a really nice thing, uh, especially because uh, this owner was either California based or right on the other side of Tahoe and Reno. Um, so kind of in a great area where, you know, it wasn't sitting out in the wet too much or um, driving on roads that had been salted after snow or <laughs> something like that. Uh, so if you get a one owner California car, that tends to kind of give buyers a peace of mind. Uh, and so cars like this yellow Dino too, it's the history behind them that I always find so fascinating uh, about these cars. And Dinos in particular uh, have always kind of appealed to me. I think it's not too much of a surprise to me that the pricing on them has gone up so much because they are extremely fun. They're easy to drive. Uh, they're gorgeous. I mean, just that Coke bottle kind of shape to it is stunning. And they're not the fastest, <laughs> but you feel like you're going fast. You know, it's, it's the way the engine sounds behind you and how it shifts and everything. It feels like a fast car, even if it's not. Uh, and so for this particular car, the, the history behind it and everything, it's one of the things that, um, so I do all the, the YouTube videos with the cars I get in and, and, um, I like showing the history and like the soul and the personality of each car because I think that the modern hypercars and supercars and everything, they're amazing. But some people, especially the younger generation, uh, a lot of people my age, they kind of start to forget about the classic cars and what made the supercars of today possible. So I love trying to kind of show the younger generation what makes these older cars so special. You could drive four Dinos back to back and they can all be in similar condition. Say they're all nice drivers. They're all going to drive different. They're all going to have different personalities to them. And this yellow one I really love because it, it has a good personality. It doesn't want to fight back too much like some of the other ones. Uh, you know, it, it, it's always kind of started up for me. The battery doesn't go dead all the time. Like in some cars, it shifts nice. It handles well. It just, it's a great car. And so it's part of like its personality and it's what makes me love the older cars. And were you asking for that one? That one we are asking for four fifty, four forty nine, dollars I believe. Yeah. So that's, I mean, it's a great place and a great car. And you're absolutely right. Like Dinos have so much personality to them and they're all so different. They all have, they all, they all talk more than I think any other, you know, sort of car yeah. from that era. I mean, Italian cars in the, in the early seventies, I think are kind of like that inherently, but Dinos especially are, are very like chirpy 
And that's one of the yeah. things that's so great about them. So they're awesome cars indeed. So, and you also bring up your YouTube channel. Uh, your YouTube, YouTube channel is excellent. It's very, very thorough. Videos are really highly produced and it's really educational. So what kind of made you get into that? And then what made you go so far with it? Because you certainly go further than a lot of other dealers do. Well, so with the whole YouTube channel, the initial thought was basically, uh, I started it quite a few years ago and it was when not a lot of dealers were doing videos. And when a buyer looks at a car online, it's nice to see static photos of the car. That's definitely important. And, you know, you read the description and all that, but there's just something different about, um, when you're looking at a car you're interested in buying, you can see it start and drive and shift go through the gears, hear the sound of it. Uh, so that was definitely the reason that we started integrating the videos into our sales process. But I also really, really wanted to avoid the videos being sales pitchy. You know, it's the, the purpose of the videos is not just to sell the car. Uh, I mean, it helps, but at the same time, the purpose was trying to kind of show the younger generation the older cars and what makes them so special and and keep that alive because I see so much focus nowadays from younger kids on hyper cars and supercars that it would really be sad to see the older cars kind of lose their histories and, and kind of fade away. So... Uh, I really like diving into the histories of these cars and what makes them so special just for that reason. Yeah, it's an excellent, excellent place to to, to kill a couple hours if, you, if you've got them. So it's very educational, very, you know, very well, like I said, well-produced videos, very thorough. So if you have an opportunity, definitely uh, visit uh, Ferraris online on uh, on YouTube. Okay, Colleen, you've pretty much been born into this. You've been doing this your entire life. So there's very few people that know more than you do. So why don't you give us one car to buy, one car to sell, and one car to hold in today's marketplace? Okay. So I think right now the Testarossa has been doing fairly well. Um, they've had kind of... So the reason the Testarossa was always uh, a little lower priced is because of the service costs. So I always take service costs into account when talking about exotic cars of any kind, but especially Ferraris and cam belts. Uh, but I really do see the Testarossa jumping up in price. And I think it's been doing really well recently. Um so that might be a car to buy, especially because I like how they drive. I like the sound. I like, uh, especially, and so if it's car to buy as future potential investment kind of purposes, the, the Testarossa itself about much more mass produced. So you want to kind of aim for the 512TR or especially the 512M. Those are always going to hold the most value. So I'd say 512M would be the buy. Uh, as far as sell, well, it depends. I mean, I, an example I've used recently, and it's definitely kind of a drastic difference than the Testarossa. So um, one of the things I've noticed with the 250 TDS is five years ago, eight years ago, they were selling consistently for roughly $8 million. And today I've seen them selling consistently for five or six. Uh, and I don't see that turning around at least not in anytime soon uh i hope in the future it turns around because i think they're fantastic cars but uh that car and then a few other cars kind of of the older era they've been hurting in the market a bit so um i mean i know that's a drastic difference but you know that's that's definitely kind of what i would put in the sell category um hold category well, the, the Countach. The Countach has been uh, doing real well, too. I mean, it's the same kind of uh, buyer as the Testarossa. It's not as accessible. You know, the price tag is much higher. And so I say buy the Testarossa because it's more entry level, it's easier, you know, more accessible, whereas the Countach is stepping it up a notch. 
But um, that one, I've definitely seen a jump in the market on it. And so I think it's going to do really well in the future. Um, even the 25th anniversary cars, which were never the most popular. And I, I kind of see why, you know, with the bumpers and all the flare and everything. It's like they took extra parts and kind of started sticking them on the car. But uh, even even the 25th anniversary ones have done fairly well recently. So I've definitely, I think that'll have good long-term potential. Yeah, the, the, those, the 25th anniversary Countaches, it almost seems like they saw the Testarossa and were like, we've got to one-up that thing. So they just started throwing vents and stuff like that on there. But yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's, it's a poster car but for a generation. And those are certainly cars that are worth hanging on to right now. As far as the 512 TRs, there seems to have been a lot of those that have come to market lately. And I saw, sort of wonder if maybe the market got oversaturated because candidly, there's really not that many buyers for that car out there, I don't think, despite how fabulous it is. Um, yeah, when, the 512 PR and the initial Testarossa, uh, I think they'll, they'll continue to do all right just because what I've seen in the market is a generational shift. And so my dad in this business, 50 years, 52 years, he's kind of been buying and selling with the same group of people forever. And my dad's now 74 and a lot of the clients he's always worked with are in their 70s or 80s. Uh, and they are a different mentality than the younger generation, the guys in their 40s who are now buying cars, because everyone wants what they had a poster of on their wall as a kid. And so, you know, I'm 31. So for my generation, it was the Testarossa, the F40, uh, the Countach. And so those cars, especially like the the Ferrari Big Five is doing really well too. The 280, F40, F50, Enzo, LaFerrari. Those are, I see those doing really well in the future, um, along with those other kind of poster cars, because that's where the market's going is towards this next generation of buyers. Oh, no doubt. And I mean, the nostalgia factor is there, but I, I think you're dead on with the Testarossa also, just for the simple fact that it's a really good driving car. It's much, much, much easier to live with than a Countach is. And, yes. and, you know, that's, that's a, a real factor for somebody who is maybe getting into this marketplace for the first time or, or is, is looking to sort of achieve that, that dream car status from when they were, you know, eight years old or five years old or whatever. So, I mean, I, for me, I'd rather have a Testarossa than a Countach. And that's primarily the reason why. So say I'm somebody who is out in the world looking to buy one of those. Um, you know, what's kind of the range on that? There's obviously a few different versions of the Testarossa, but how much money should I plan on spending if I want to acquire one? Uh, so it really depends on what you're looking for. Uh, but let's just kind of pin it down to, uh, a good driver that is serviced, um, you know, average miles. So say 25,000 miles, uh, good condition, but not, not flawless. Uh, you know, a couple little rock chips. Cause those, those front spoilers are so low that they just get peppered. Uh, and, you know, so just a really good driving car. I'd say you're looking today at about 150, uh, which is kind of crazy because a few years, probably actually about 10 years ago now, uh, we sold a Testarossa for a client. It was like less than 10,000 miles, great condition, came with a full luggage set, all the books and tools and all that stuff. And we sold it for like 50 grand because Testarossa's were priced below 50 grand unless it was one of the best. And uh, so seeing them triple in value or well, more than that, a car like that today would be, you know, a lot more than 150. But seeing the value go like that is kind of where I get that, um, that thought, you know, that buy thought from because I think that is going to continue. And obviously the market kind of goes up and then flattens a bit. But uh, I think since this generation's really into those cars, it may go up and flatten as the market gets saturated. And then once it thins out a bit, it'll go back up. So um, I have faith in them. Yeah, yeah. I don't think those cars are done either. So uh, any final thoughts? Uh, well, I just find it so interesting to uh, kind of see the market changing because being around this my whole life, it's always been kind of the focus on the 
60s, 70s, 80s cars. And that's definitely where my my heart lies. I love the older cars. Uh, but seeing the new generation get into the market, seeing all these new cars and, and uh, the new performance cars and comparing them, I mean, being at Goodwood, seeing the brand new stuff run with Lucy Bell, you know, the 250 TR and 250 GTOs and that combination, it's it's kind of, it's amazing to watch and observe and, and have the privilege to be a part of this automotive world, you know? Yeah, it's amazing stuff, you know, quite an experience. And it is it is fun to see those retro cars definitely sort of next to the, you know, the mid-century stuff for sure. So uh, where can people go to learn more? So uh, our website is ferraris-online.com and the cars we spoke about today are on the website and then a lot more is coming soon. We had uh, three new cars dropped off recently and we get more in all the time. Uh, and then our YouTube channel, Ferraris Online, has uh, all the videos I do on the cars I sell. And I try and, like I said, give the histories and not be too sales pitchy. So, uh, And then pretty much you could find us uh, on most social media platforms as well. Yeah. And again, uh, make sure to take time to go check out the YouTube channel. It's, it's really worth a, worth a look for sure. I would like to thank Colleen Sheehan for joining us today. To learn more about anything that we discussed here, be sure to pick up the latest issue of Sports Car Market Magazine by visiting the link in the video description down below. As a reminder, if you enjoyed this content, please take a moment to like and share this video, and don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon to stay on top of future episodes. I'm Darren Roberge, and thank you for joining us on the Buy, Sell, Hold Spotlight.